We have a, a, a rare treat here in bringing back one of, our, one of our own to share with us in this beautiful song. Michael Roadhorst is going to be sharing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Mike, why don't you, before you begin, I don't mean to throw you off, but tell us where you are and tell us a little bit about your family for those of you who remember you when you were yay high. Sure. Um, so, hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I was here back in the 90s and 80s, I guess. Uh, so I'm currently living near Boston in Belmont, Massachusetts, where I attend uh, First, uh, sorry, Plymouth Congregational Church. Uh, and um, I, my wife, Kristen, and uh, my three daughters are currently uh, visiting friends out of state. Uh, and so I took the opportunity to come here to visit you all and my parents. Uh, and um, yeah, really blessed to be here. Thank you.
God is faithful, so faithful. He's faithful in the good times, and we are quick to acknowledge that when we say thank you, God, for the blessings. And he's also faithful in those difficult times when our world seems to be falling apart, when, when sickness and illness are taking their toll on our bodies or the bodies of those we love. And he's especially faithful in those moments of deep grief. As we gather together today, we come to this time of prayer, and, and again, I think about this every Christmas where the Prince of Peace has come, and yet uh, the world is still filled with strife, and we know that on a personal level. Uh, our prayers, especially are this week with, um, with Joanne Faola and her family after a, a battle, a long battle with cancer. Joanne's daughter, Lori, passed away the other day, and so... Uh, we, we know that she's with Jesus, her faith is strong, and, and uh, that uh, Joanne and the family will see her again, but it doesn't make it any easier, but we, we know that our God is faithful, he wraps his arms around us in times like that, he gives us a good man to stand with us in Mark, and so our prayers are with you, Joanne, and with all the family this week. We want to also think of others who we know who are going through difficult times. I continue to lift up my friend Adele, who is the longtime organist at the First Baptist Church in Norwich, my former church. We continue to lift up uh, God's presence with her as she battles her cancer. We lift up Curtis Moosey. Uh, I talked with his wife not too long ago, and he's had some medical issues, and so we want to just pray for Curtis. want to lift up Andy Gerbatovich. Andrew Gerbatovich uh, had a bad uh, fall and broke his wrist and had surgery, and hopefully the surgery went well. Good. Janet says good. So we pray for healing. Uh, Andrew is a very active young man, and so we, uh, we know that he wants to get back going again before long. I want to lift up Paul Arnold in our continuing prayers after his recent hospital stay, Vicki Keene after her recent surgeries. We lift up June Diptolsky, Ray's wife. Um, she is battling COVID right now, and so we think of her. Uh, we lift up Ann Mason after her uh, recent uh, troubles uh, with her health. We lift up Allison Ballantyne in our continuing prayers, Marianne Resendez, Marsha Erskine. I had a nice talk with Marsha, and she's uh, hoping to get out a little bit more, but she's really been struggling since uh, her recent surgery. And I want to lift up Bob Robinson, a good friend of uh, Phil and Jen Bryan, who's been struggling and uh, just needs prayer so he can regain his strength, get back on his feet, and get home again. And there may be others, too. Uh, I know there was a nice article in the paper today about the Avondale Chapel, and uh, we want to pray a blessing on the celebration next week. Uh, we hope that uh, it really is a, a reminder of God's faithfulness to that small group that started 175 years ago and have continued to do some type of ministry. And again, now part of our ministry, an extension of our ministry there. So we pray a blessing on them, and we know that uh, Don and Linda and the committee have been working hard. We want to continue to lift up the Ukraine and other trouble spots across the world. Even in our own country, we know that there are many great challenges, and we pray for our nation, we pray for our, our leaders, and we pray for wisdom that they might hear the counsel of God in all the decisions. Are there others that we want to think of today, especially as we come together in prayer? Anybody else? Yes. We lift up your friend Chris in prayer today. Okay, good. Yes, Jerry. We lift up uh, Tom. Uh, Tom just had a birthday this week, I think, uh, and so we lift up Tom in the sudden loss of his uh, fiance. We lift up Marilyn, who is who is uh, very much, uh, very much uh, with Tom, and and it's just been a tough time for the whole family. It's just so sudden. So we lift them up in our prayers today. Thank you, Jerry. Any others we want to lift up? Yes. We lift up your daughter and your children, Jen, who have COVID. We pray for healing for all of them. Yeah, any others? Yes, Ellen. We lift up your daughter, Nancy, in our prayers, and we pray that God will be with her. Yes, yes, any others? 
Well, I want to invite you now just to take the next few moments as we have a little bit of silence to, if you've got something on your heart and mind, maybe you didn't want to share it out loud, but there's something troubling you to just share it with the Lord and, uh, and know that God is so good and so faithful that he will be with you in the midst of that and with those people you pray for. Let's continue in the spirit of prayer with silent prayer, then I'll pray and we'll close with a congregational prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God of involvement, that you are not some distant deity that is off in some other world and just letting things happen, that from the very beginning of the Bible, we're told that you invested yourself in this creation when you created Adam and Eve and you had a plan for the world. And Lord, even though the plan went askew, Lord, we know that you have never given up And Lord, that's true in our lives too. Sometimes we stray and we head down a different path than you had hoped for us, intended for us, planned for us, and yet you don't give up on us. You continue to to reach out, to follow, to chase after us even, to bring us home. Oh Lord, the Bible is filled with stories like that. And Lord, it's those stories that give us hope in the midst of trouble. They remind us of your faithfulness and they remind us of your amazing grace. Oh Lord, as we gather together today, let us take heart in the words of Scripture and the truth and the knowledge we have of you from the testimonies of the faithful. Lord, we think about what's written in Hebrews and we think about that long line of faithful men and women who answered the call, who rose to the occasion. And Lord, we thank you that that you always send people into our lives to, to minister to us in these times of need. And Lord, we thank you that Even though it's very intimidating, sometimes you send us to be the light, to be the hope, to be the grace in our friends' lives. And Lord, just as today we've lifted a few of them up, oh Lord, we ask your blessing on them, your presence to be felt by them, your healing touch, your comforting presence to be with each and every one. Lord, we know that we live in a fallen world and as such there is trouble, it seems like everywhere at times. But Lord, we thank you for for the men and women you've raised up as leaders. And we pray, Lord, that they'll hear your voice and that they will will act justly and that they will bring mercy with humility to the situations as they listen to your call and act out your will. Lord, hear our prayers. Oh Lord, as we come together today, we pray a prayer on every blessing, every family here. Prayer blessing on every family. Oh, Lord, may they know your love and your grace. May the homes that attend this church know that you are with them and you care for them. Lord, we ask you to be with our sister churches across the town and and across the world as they preach the good news to a world that desperately needs it. Oh, Lord, may your word not come back empty and may we see a change in the world and let it begin right here. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers today as we come together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer now as we come with one voice as one congregation in our congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we belong to you. We trust that you will give us the strength and wisdom we need to endure the challenges we face. Help us to remember that nothing is more important than being faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. The scripture reading today is taken from Galatians 1, verses 6 through 10. It can be found on page 1808, pardon me, 1809 in your pew Bibles or on the front screens. Galatians 1, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, 
If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Blessed be his reading. We're going to sing now um, our next hymn, Standing on the Promises of God, number 552, verses 1, 2, and 4. Six. How about that one? Standing on the promises, verses one, two, and four. Please be seated. Before I begin, I just want to say a couple of things. I want to say happy birthday to Bailey, who's up in the balcony, and to Kathy Niles, who have birthdays this week. I, I also want to, I want to point out that Symphony McClure is here uh, on a, a little break, a summer break from school, visiting her mom and her, her family, uh, and Symphony was one of our scholarship winners. Uh, also, we have Tony and Kate Perone who aren't here, and George and Marianne Resendez who are celebrating anniversaries. And uh, I know, uh, I think it's uh, Lenny Ballesteros has a birthday. So you're, you're saying, why did he say all this? Uh, oh, yeah, and I wanted to remind you that uh, the Kentucky Mission Team is inviting everyone for dessert and a presentation on Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. And, and the team really did some great work, and, and I hope that you'll come out and you'll hear about it and see. Well, okay. Why did I say that? Oh, oh, I want you to like me, okay? <laughs> and, and especially the mission team and those who have birthdays. I remember Marsha Erskine said to me one time, she said, hey, she said, you know, we have these birthdays listed in the bulletins. And if you say them out loud, you know, then, then if you skip someone or miss someone, they're going to be offended. And so for a long time, I didn't. But then someone said to me, they said, well, you didn't mention my birthday this week. And I thought, well, maybe I bet... 
Well, let me get into the sermon and maybe you'll understand my, my dilemma here, okay? Because this morning I want to talk about the search for approval. You know, so many people live to hear someone tell them that they're liked or that what they're doing is approved. We got some reverberation here? Is that me? Okay, so um, what do I do? There we go. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Do you still like me? There we go. Maybe it's this microphone here. Should I unplug this or something? Okay, well, there we go. You're going to have to, boy, I'll tell you, I'm not going to get good reviews after this Sunday, and that's going to just shoot my ego right down. And we didn't plan this at all. I don't know. But you know, the truth is so many people live for the approval of others. They want to know that they're liked, that they're respected, appreciated, and loved. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be liked, but when it becomes an obsession, when it becomes the the center of your life and your being, where where you're trying to, to do things just for the approval of others, you better be careful. You know, I'll never forget my teacher Uh, telling me, you got it now, just keep doing it. You don't need to come up here every time to get my approval. I was in the third grade, and it was a math class, and every time I did an example, I brought it up to the teacher and said, how's this, how's this, is this right? After the tenth time, she said those words to me, you don't need, just keep doing it. I think the reason it sticks out in my mind is because at 60 plus years old, Sometimes it feels like I'm still looking for approval for the things that I do. And I don't think that I'm alone. Even if we don't consciously recognize that, we do tempt to want to please people. We want to do things that will make us be liked. For some people, the need to seek approval is as important as fame and fortune is for others. It's one of the carrots that we chase. And we're in this series talking about chasing carrots. And why are we doing it? Why do we take our focus off of God and chase other things to try to find our happiness in life? Some people can't do anything without checking which way the wind is blowing. Just ask any number of the politicians in Washington. It seems that they live by polling and make decisions based upon what focus groups say. Whatever happened to simply doing the right thing? We don't need a windsock for that. It doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing if you're going to do the right thing. The challenge is finding out what the right thing is and who you are listening to. The problem is that most of us care about what people think. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should live in such a way that people like and respect us because we're living faithfully according to our principles and for us as Christians according to the word that God has given us. The problem develops when it becomes such an obsession and when we start prioritizing what other people think and deciding how to live our lives on that over what God calls us to be and do. You know, Harriet Breaker, a renowned author of the books The Disease to Please and Who's Pulling Your Strings, says that this deep desire to please is actually a form of addiction. Just like a drug addict seeks drug, people pleasers seek approval and they get something from it, an adrenaline rush when everybody claps and says, oh, you're so wonderful, you did such a great job. It becomes a driving force in everything they do. You see this in social media, where some people are obsessed with getting likes on their Facebook page or on their Instagram page, where the number of followers they have is something that pleases them greatly because it makes them feel important. It becomes a driving force, and they can't do anything without this approval of others. You see this play out in three different ways, really. The first is, is what I like to call the fishermen, okay? And we all know people who continually ask questions like, oh, do you like my new outfit? Now, again, it's okay if you're a husband or a wife and you're asking because they have to go out with you, okay? <laughs> but when everyone you see says, oh, do you like this? Oh, do you like this? Oh, do you like, oh, look at this, I've got a new Or, Or another way it plays out is, is did you like that picture I posted? Or did you like that, that post that I made? Uh, or, or how about this one? Someone who's always asking, are we okay? 
you know, are, are we doing well? How, how's our relationship? You know, it's okay to ask these questions, but if we ask it continually, continually looking for some kind of affirmation, fishing for some kind of compliment, then we may have a problem. You can make someone's day by responding positively, which brings up the second play, which is what I like to call the flat tire. You know, people who are always looking for approval get very despondent when someone criticizes them or gives them a critique. You know, you can have a hundred different positive responses. You know, and this is, it particularly applies to preachers. You know, you can have a hundred people go through the line and say, great sermon, pastor, great sermon, pastor. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh, you really touched me. And then one person will go through the line and say, yeah, you were a little off today. <laughs> That was just Lori, so that's okay. I, I've, already, I've already taken her account. So. But, but, you know, again, we, we see this in these people pleasers that, that, that sometimes when you want to critique them, like at work, when, when the boss says, you know, you did a pretty good job in this project, but you're a little weak in this area, it deflates them, and they're just destroyed, and it's as if their whole world has been crashing down. The third way this plays out is what I call the energizer bunny, the person who can never say no, the person who is always doing things. We're so obsessed with what other people think about us that we struggle to say no when we realize that we really should. You go to the party that you're dreading and you go out with a guy that you'd rather not see ever again. Why? Because you find it so difficult to say no and you end up being overcommitted all the time always helping out, always running. And we know people like that, and sometimes it's me or you who do that. You don't say no because you don't want people to think badly of you. Well, Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of man will be a snare. The Hebrew word translated as snare is the word which literally means a noose, uh, the kind that goes around an animal's head, almost like a bridle, so that you can control that animal. Or uh, it's a hook, like you've probably seen bulls, where there's a hook in their nose, and they tie a, a rope to it so that it leads the, the bull or the, the cow wherever way. And so what Proverbs is saying is that the fear of man or, or this, this worry about what people are thinking about you will be like a noose or a, a ring that will lead you on what could be a very difficult journey. It's like an animal being pulled around all the time by that hook because you're hooked on what someone else may think. And it's a pretty good image of what it's like when we're obsessed with what other people think. Our whole life is, is looking for affirmation from someone. But in the passage in Proverbs, it continues. It says, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. Whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. What it's really doing and saying is this, that when we trust in the Lord, we don't have to worry about that. That we know that God is faithful. As Michael sang about a few minutes ago, as that text in Hebrews, our responsive reading, spoke of that God has been faithful to the generations. And when we trust in God, we can always expect that God will deliver on His promises. As we sang, we stand on those promises, the promises of the Word of God. We have the testimony of those who have walked with God, and we know that when we trust in God, when we seek His approval, then life is going to be much better. Chasing down a path of other people's approval will always lead to a dead end. It will lead you down a path that leads to disappointment because we all know people who are negative. And if we tap into what they're saying, We'll never, ever get the affirmation we need. But if you lean, if you learn to look at God and trust Him and His assessment of who you are and what He's called you to do, you will be blessed. Everything that we've talked about in the last four weeks at its core is at its root a spiritual issue. What are you chasing after? When we chase after the opinions of men or women, we find a dead end. But when we chase after the approval of God, we find the fruit. When you become obsessed with these other things, it leads to our disappointment. But when we go to God and find our approval in Him, we find our joy. So, we've had, have a, so we have to have a different goal. 
we got to pursue something different instead of living for the approval of them. We have to literally build our lives around living for God and God alone, not just in theory, but in actuality. This is the way the Apostle Paul lived his life. We've got a great example as we read through the letters, as we read through the book of Acts, and we see how he engaged. He was never one to shy away from confrontation. He was never one to stand, never one not to stand up for the truth of the gospel. He lived in such a way that, that the opinions of others did not matter. He thought he was living for God in his earlier days, but he began to realize that he was living that other way, living for the approval of others. And so in Galatians 1, he says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but God. You have to understand at this point in Paul's ministry, everything had changed and everyone had seen the change. The people in Galatia knew all of the things in Paul's life gave credibility to his word. He'd been in prison several times for his faith. He never shied away from preaching the gospel, even if it meant to his own detriment. I'm sure that some of his friends probably told him, Paul, you better tone it down a little bit. You know, the leaders are going to get upset with you. But he said, this is the word of God and I can't stop but preaching. And so he ended in jail at times. He'd been shipwrecked and left for dead because the people were afraid of his connections with God and it seemed like all kinds of things were happening. The religious elite had abandoned him and thought that he was wrong but he wasn't living for the approval of the people, but for the sake of Christ. He says, I'm not living for the approval of people, but God. And then he makes one of the most sobering statements in the Bible. In verse 10, he says, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. He says, you can't be following God if you're always looking for the approval of other people. You have to look to God first and only look for his approval. A lot of us, and I'll tell you why this matters, a lot of us are, are sometimes hesitant to speak up for our faith, especially in this day and age. Why? Because either we're not confident in what we believe, or we're afraid of what others may think. Let me say that again. Because we're not confident in what we believe, or we're afraid of what others may think. So let me talk about that for a minute. The first statement can easily be addressed. Why aren't we confident in what we believe? Well, maybe it's because we haven't gotten into the Word. Maybe we haven't uh, been studying the Bible so we don't know what God is calling us to do and to be. Maybe it's because we're not confident of the promises of God and how God has said He would stand with us when we are faithful and true. Maybe we haven't gotten into the Word and we don't believe that God is faithful as it says and shows everywhere. Maybe if we started reading the Bible daily, maybe if we got into small groups and began to discuss our faith with others, that that faith would grow and our confidence would grow as well. And so that we could trust in what we read in the Scriptures, trust in what we've learned and what we believe. And then the whole world would change. You know, I want to give you an example of this. Down at the firehouse, I've been talking about driving the boat for three years. There's a fire boat down in Watch Hill, and, and from the first summer, one of the officers said, Cal, you ought to learn to drive the boat, because if you could drive that boat, there might be a call where you could drive, and I'm an EMT, and I could be taking care of the patient, but if I have to take care of the patient, and, and no one else knows how to drive the boat, we're in trouble. And so I said, yeah, I'm going to learn how to drive the boat. They gave me a book. They told me where to find the course. And it's three years later, and I still can't drive the boat. You know, I wanted to do it. You know, and some of us, that's the way it is with our faith. We want to go to Bible study. We want to read the Bible, and we say we're going to do it, and, and yet we don't. I have no confidence. I went out on the boat the other night, and they had me as the lookout. And I think I did okay. We didn't find anything. <laughs> Someone else found it. I got back and I said, boy, am I glad somebody else found No, I'm, I'm, I, Bill Davis is here and he's a member of the department. He's going to go back and tell on me. Um, but, you, you know, I didn't have that confidence because I'd never prepared. And, and so when it comes to our faith, it's the same thing. Just because you've been baptized, just because you've come to church a few times does not mean that you have the confidence to be able to speak out and share your faith with another person. 
It only comes when you get into the Word and you begin to, to, to make it a part of who you are and then the confidence grows. When you know the Bible, you'll be more confident in trusting what it has to say. We'll never know it all, but we need each other and each other together we can grow in our faith. The second thing has to do with worrying about what others think. Again, going back to that thing of trying to please people. And some of us are great Christian secret agents. We go out into the world and we don't let anybody know that we are Christians and we go to church and that we have faith. We keep our mouths shut and we kind of infiltrate the world and we're part of the world and we're so much a part of the world that people don't know if we're really one of them or not. They just think, oh, he's one of us, she's one of us. There's nothing different about them. And yet the scriptures call us to be different. We're to be separated. We're supposed to be a light in the darkness. That when we go out into the world, people should know that we belong to Christ. But we're worried because if we show up and we're too Christ-like, maybe people won't like us or they won't approve of what we say or what we do. And so we look for their approval and we take our eyes off of God and we focus only on ourselves. You know, this is exactly what Paul was talking about in this passage in Galatians. Who are you looking for approval from? Is it that third grade teacher that I mentioned? Or is it your next door neighbor or, or the member in the club that you belong to? Or someone else? The apostle tells us that when it comes to approval, he looks to God first and foremost. For that is who he serves. He says you can't serve someone else and serve God. God has to be the source that gives you life and gives you standing in the world. And when we, are, when we are looking to God for approval, it makes all the difference. When we do that, we will be blessed. That's where meaning and significance in life come from. That's where our greatest joy is uncovered. So if anything, we should be chasing after God, not some carrot. You'll never need a windsock to know what to do if you make God the focus of your life. You won't have to be testing the winds because you can stand on the word of God because God is faithful as Michael sang. God is faithful. You see, the message of the gospel is this. God's love and grace are so amazing that he gave up his only begotten son so that we could live with him forever. Your friend, the person you're going to for advice may give good advice but they're not going to die for you like Jesus did. And see, the beauty of that is that God loves each and every one of us so much that he will never lead us astray. He'll only lead us home. God's grace is so amazing. God's grace is so encompassing, all-encompassing, that when we come to God, we'll never be disappointed We'll never be led astray. We will never find ourselves on the wrong path. We will always be doing exactly what we were meant to do, what we were created to do. And may our love, the love that comes from God and is shared in and through us, be that amazing that it touches others' lives. Amen. We're going to close our service today with a special trio that Phil, Jonathan, and I have been working on. And, um, and I, I, we're not going to seek your approval on it. We're just going to sing it. <laughs> it's titled, Your Grace Still Amazes Me. And I want to th say, thank Dave Blanton as well for giving us a little backdrop and for the tech team, which has put together the soundtrack behind us.
You see, we can trust God because his grace is so amazing that he'll always be there for you. He'll always be in your corner. He'll always show you the right way. So trust in God. Don't chase after everyone else's approval. Follow and chase only after God. Amen. Amen. Now, as we prepare to go our way this day, I want to encourage you to really do that to chase after God, to look to God, to find ways where you can grow in your faith so that you will be confident that He's leading you every day. Go now 
in the peace and the glory and the strength of Jesus. Amen.